Hey everyone, welcome to the Fullest Podcast. I'm your host, Nikki Bostwick, and today's guest is Jani Organically, who's a wellness advocate, and she is always here to question, challenge, and examine the norm. Hi, Jani. Hi, Nikki. I'm so excited to be here with you. I just have been such a big fan of yours. I just like I'm excited to chat with you about how you started Janny Organically. You started it so long ago, nine years ago. Mm -hmm. You were a mom of a one-year-old yes. with a pixie cut we were just talking about. <laughs> yes, I had to like, pull up those pictures. Yeah. And you've grown so much and I'm just, you know, really inspired by your journey and the fact that you're so willing to share and be vulnerable and also know when not to share and process your own emotions and when to kind of come and um, share your healing with others because mm -hmm. it's it's been so helpful for me and for so many people I know. So I just, I'm really excited to hear more from you about your personal journey. Yeah. So like you said, the nine years ago, Janie Organically started and funny enough, it had nothing to do with ingredients or sourcing. It was genuinely about sharing the season of life like whatever comes up organically, that's what I was sharing. And at the time, I had a one-year-old and it was motherhood and it was navigating through some hormonal challenges and trying to figure out like where that might maybe be coming from and kind of exploring what was coming into my home in terms of beauty and skincare and household products, whatever could be an endocrine disruptor, whatever food, trying to figure out how to balance my hormones that were seemingly all over the place. So that's kind of where it started. And at the time you were just like getting into that sort of lifestyle or you had been in it and wanted to share with others? No, I was kind of learning along with everyone else. It was, I was, I think there are always two camps of people that when they find out, hey, I can do better in terms of ingredients that you can dump everything that's in your house or you kind of wait for something to finish and then you replace that. I was a dump everything. I'm like that too. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, so I was kind of like, like found yes. out and then dumped it all. Yes, like all the shampoo, you know, body, skincare, like everything was just like in the trash and replacing it and trying and just sharing. And I look back and see like what I replaced it with. It was better. And then it kept, kept, getting, better. kept getting better as I like educated myself. And now I like have all my stuff. Yeah. Did you uh, like work with a naturopath or someone that was guiding you along the way or was it kind of like researching on the internet? Uh, a little bit of both. I mean, I had gone to like a hormone special. I mean, I had been in the conventional medicine world f since I was little um, and I have a lot of medical stories. But once I, I, a lot of people can probably relate to this. Once you find out you're pregnant, like you're, you kind of kicks things into high gear. However, yeah. I was having like these hormonal problems and found a naturopathic doctor that was actually listening to me because how many times do we go and run labs and they're like, your labs came back normal. And you're like, no, this there's something not right. And maybe you're in range, but you're not optimal and why. And so that was kind of my journey of figuring out like how to get my hormones into an optimal range so that I actually felt good and I didn't feel crazy. Because in the conventional world, even something like PMS is, it's just something that, you know, yeah. get used to it. Like that's yeah. just part of life. And I just wasn't willing to accept that. And uh, so I did find a naturopathic doctor and it was the month before I got pregnant. So she had ordered all these labs and was like, basically wait for your next period. And then you wait a certain amount of days. And then that just never happened. Oh my so gosh. Um, funny enough, though, I had the labs on file. And so when I went to do like my first labs when I was pregnant, they ran all the other ones too. Oh, yeah. And I just remember seeing how much blood they took. And they're like, there were a lot of, there's a lot of requests in here. And um, so half of them were invalid yeah. because- You're pregnant. Yeah. So were you trying to kind of get the hormones under control to get pregnant? No. no. Like you weren't- did you? It was unplanned. Oh, okay. Perfect. <laughs> it was just, it just happened. Okay. So yeah. So it was like, you know, I was pregnant and they were kind of operating under the guess that I had PCOS, even though I okay. had had, and I feel like that has been used as like a 
kind of umbrella term. Yeah. We don't really know what's going on with your hormones. We've done the internal ultrasound. There's no cysts, but your LSH and FSH are, you know, reversed. So you probably have PCOS. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I could be sitting in a room with, you know, eight people and we're all, we all have PCOS and we all have totally different symptoms. And it all manifested differently. We had hormonal problems. We just didn't know yeah. how to deal with it. So me looking at like how, what can I control from the outside that may be disrupting my hormones was kind of like the journey I was on. And that's how I found myself in like the motherhood world online. And it mm-hmm. was like at early stages of Instagram. And so there was like a lot of us that kind of came up together that were like in the early motherhood stages and exploring clean beauty. And so we were all in this little niche of like young moms in clean beauty that we had our like little community that, you know, we formed online and most of them I'm still friends with today that are, um, we've all kind of gone different routes. Some of them have stayed in like clean beauty. Some have stayed in motherhood and I've gone up and done <laughs> a lot of crazy things. <laughs> But still along those lines in a way. Yeah, I always yeah. bring it in. Yeah. Yes. And by the way, I'm at the Capitol with Laurel Skincare. Oh my gosh, so crazy. Some Ion Bio. Yeah. Okay, so you kind of, like how did people early on on Instagram like, find you? It was like through hashtags and stuff, right? Like it's so crazy. Yes. And we had our own hashtags at the time too. It was like, and we didn't even know the difference between what was green beauty and clean beauty. And like we, we had our own you know, little community of stuff who we would hashtag and hashtag Danny organically, hashtag clean beauty finds. I don't know. I don't remember. Yeah. It's but yeah. so crazy. Like how much has changed in nine years. Yeah. But- like one of my friends, Courtney, who is like one of my best friends now was like subscribing to our stuff. Like she was a participant in like what clean beauty brands back when Courtney wore makeup. It was, it's so funny to see. Um, Cause she's just, doesn't do doesn't any of that now. Makeup? And she's her own brand now. And she's... what? Uh, who is that? Courtney Kayla. Oh, okay. The chiropractor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it's funny, like, because, like, she was kind of just part of, like, the community of, like, oh, what what are you finding now? And now she's, like, her own wealth of resource and That's her own little so wellness crazy. community, which is... I'm just so proud of her. I know. All of her recommendations. I did, like, um, Kylie and I, who I work with, we did her underarm... Detox, oh yeah like, yeah deodorant but it was so funny because it was during covid and then my husband was like you need to put on deodorant like you need to put on deodorant but like i couldn't smell i was like this is like totally working and he didn't have it and i had this like little spray that i would put and he's like no it's not working yeah and like, i'm like you know i tell courtney too because she doesn't wear deodorant and people ask me does she smell i'm like i have smelled her armpits she doesn't stink That's so insane. but if i do what she does no, it doesn't smell good. So Their funny. own little body chemistry. So you like got into the motherhood thing, but then when did like sourcing and all that? So it really came from like sharing your life organically to literally getting into sourcing and all well, that? Well, yeah, because you start to partner with brands, right? Yeah. And you start to learn that, um, yeah, where are you getting your stuff? Is how How is it made? Is it heated? Like, how am I getting like the purest ingredients? What are you doing to preserve it? Like what? Um, and then am I in alignment with the owner? So I started to get to know the brand owners and that became kind of a prerequisite. Like I need access to that person and I want to know what their philosophy is. And so along the way, I've met so many wonderful people that are that I can genuinely call my friends. And when people come over and see my products, I'm like, I know all the people who so make this cool. and I know exactly where it's made and you know, where like the farms that they're from. And it's like such a special thing that I'm like in the shower with like, you know, my Laurel face wash and you know, Olivia skincare. And I'm like, okay, that's Laurel's, that's Kelly's, that's Jenna. That's, you know, these are people to me, not just products that I yeah. picked up at a store. Yeah. It feels even as they scale, they keep their philosophy and, um, and it feels like, they're just your friends that made a product. For yes. You. Like it's when so I talk crazy. about it, it's just like, oh yeah, my friend, you know, this. So crazy. And then like, how, what about food? Like how did food get incorporated into your kind of like journey with hormones? And like, what do you do right now with food? I'm curious. Well, yeah, I think <laughs> I've been through a lot with, with food because whatever 
clean eating was to me 10 years ago and to now is totally different and like it really the, is yeah. because I was I wouldn't say completely vegan I was basically vegan but I had honey and eggs for like five years and even when I say that it's just a little I was vegan I mean I went to school culinary school for raw food like I was like fully so I fully totally vegan. get it yes I was fully vegan and now no, no. Okay. I prefer plant based food, but I like know that I need meat. So I'm just curious. What well, and then diet- last year I had literally nothing green. Like I had this, I was just like, no nope. carnivore but, diet? Or no, like- it wasn't carnivore. It was just, I didn't have any leafy greens. Like, and my vegetables were like root vegetables. And I just refused. It just, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to listen to my body. And I don't want any of that. And wow. so I went a whole year now. I'm like incorporating it. So there's, it's always changing. And that's why like, if you go on my blog now, like all of my stuff is, is archived because it's so hard for me to share a journey and then say, this is what I believe. And then you're like, you know, six months later, I'm like, I don't actually believe that anymore Yeah, because I'm constantly evolving. That's why I think ex- I love that. expiring stories work so well Yeah, because this is just what I'm doing now. And don't look at what I'm doing and think that this is the way this is my way today. Yeah. And I'm figuring it out as I go. And it, in seasons of life are going to change. And so, yeah, with the vegan thing is, is a little, you know, I, I could not do that right now. Uh, but for the moment, like I've finally learned how to eat, I think. Because <laughs> I, I, one of the things I really prided myself in was that I was never concerned about like calories or counting anything and nor weighing my food. I just felt like that was extreme. Well, then I was kind of coached this past year about like pairing my macros. And I'm like, I don't even know what macros are. That's like what I was just asking. What does that mean? So like, you know, the right amount of carbs and protein and fats in in your meals because we can only you know absorb and use so much otherwise it's just storing as excess like fat that we're mm-hmm. not gonna use even protein can do that for you so you can't just sit down and have like us like sit down and have like 50 grams of protein we can't our bodies can't use that as fuel for like you know the next few hours like it's and then we're gonna eat again like we just have too much and so it wasn't it's not about like necessarily portion control as much as it is like balancing the right amounts. And I was like the majority of my diet in the last year was fat. My, I had a health coach that was looking and going, okay, well, I think we found some tweaks that we can make. So I'm like a daily on a daily basis was having like a hundred grams of fat. And I'm like, is that bad? She's like, well, I think maybe like, let's cut that in half. And I'm like, I can't imagine, you know? Yeah. Um, so like in the morning where I would be, what she would call like carb bombing or fat bombing because I would have like my full fat matcha and I would have like two or three eggs and um, and toast and butter and all the, it was just too much in one sitting. And she's like, okay, so what if we didn't do the matcha? And I'm like, Mm-mm, no, I'm gonna, yeah. I would rather not have the eggs. Like yeah. I, I have to have my morning ritual with my matcha. So I do my matcha with an egg and and some carbs, whether it's like fruit or a piece of sourdough toast or something. So, and I am a creature of habit. That's just my morning routine. And then throughout the day, that'll, my meals shift, but I, I have learned to balance. And I did go and weigh my, I had to weigh my food to like with grams. And cause Each I time like, you ate it? every meal for my coach to look at and I would log everything I ate for like several weeks That's and she so would hard. examine it and it was tricky and I realized I'm like you know I feel like I've looked at people do this before and think that is so unhealthy for you to do but for me it was like coaching myself like what does 14 grams of fat look, look like like yeah what it's does, so true so like and I think on my, I eat, I like every three hours. Um, I'm supposed to have like 36 grams of carbs per meal. What does that look like? The rice looks different than sweet potatoes, looks different than fruit. And so like, I just had to get that visual. Yeah. And like, I just, I feel like, and people were watching me do this. Like, cause I had a school at my house and they're like, 
oh, you're so intense. And I'm like, I'm just trying to learn. And I realized it's like the people on the outside looking at it, that's who it's unhealthy for. So I had to really educate my daughter on what I was doing. And I was like, okay, your portions look totally different than mine, girl, because you are very lean and thin and you need twice as much as this than me. And we're all different. And so it was just like educating because I didn't want that stigma of like, I am trying to like, you know, yeah. like restrict myself. It was just like, I want to know what these, what does that look like? What does this amount of grams look like? And so now I know I don't have to weigh it anymore, but I had to, I had to do it. Speaking of motherhood and your daughter and like, just those things, you know, trying to educate your daughter Mm -hmm. or even like healing. You know, we talked a lot and, um, we, I think we both are really passionate about ancestral healing and healing things through a lineage. So it doesn't pass down. So I want to kind of talk about the food thing and then I want to get into like hormonal and, Mm -hmm. and kind of the therapy stuff. Yeah. But with the food thing specifically, since we're on the subject, yeah, like, through that time, did you also just educate your daughter about what all that looks like too? Or you just kind of just were mentioning it? Well, I think from birth, she was um, kind of educated about like ingredients. Yeah. And so it it was mostly whether we were vegan or not, like it was whole, we were eating whole foods, very little packaged processed stuff. So her first experience with like the girl had gum for the first time without my knowledge when she was like eight. And then now she's like, she's, she's had it a few times, but like things like that, she just wasn't having. Um, But she, she would know, like she could connect like to her, how she felt because she ate something that wasn't necessarily that great but she was that kid in kindergarten when they would pass out popsicles and she'd be like is this does this have artificial dye literally does this have refined sugar (laughs) people are just like what does this have red 40 yeah oh my gosh like she knew specifics yeah I know it's it's interesting because it's like I'm sure a lot more kids are being raised that way than we think too Mm mm-hmm but um, but some people, like you said, from the outside, it just seems so extreme. But it's not really extreme if you are just educating and um, and I feel like not causing anxiety over it mm-hmm. either. Where it's like stressful if it if that's there and it's not good for the. I don't know. Those- well, and I think even in the past, like year or so, because you mentioned like therapy and healing, and and there have been a lot that I have like release because I have wanted to have control over things. And like, I don't want her to be exposed. She did go through this season um, that I did talk about on the blog. And uh, my friend, Olivia, who's from Organic Olivia, she um, talked about it on her podcast with specifically my daughter having like this reaction post a viral infection where I think the terminology is called like post-infection hyperstimulation. Where my daughter would, her whole body was covered in hives when she ate anything. Whoa. She's she's one of those kids who gets the rare side effect if she gets sick. Like Whoa. when she had hand, foot, mouth, like her toenails and fingernails fell off. It's got this re- really long name. When she got COVID, she got the post-COVID rash. Um, she's just a little... Yeah, if it says like there's a rare side effect of this, she she's probably going to have it. Oh my gosh. So, but at the time, I had she had a um, a natural doctor, and I had my naturopathic doctor. Both of them were like, "Oh no, she's developing food allergies," and I'm like, "No, that's not. This is not right." And I called Olivia, and I'm like, "Dude, this is what's happening." And she was like, "No, no, go give her some mushrooms, like adaptogenic mushrooms. Have me make a broth. I happen to have like dried mushrooms, and I made her drink that." before she ate and but this was happening for like two or three days like her fingers looked like little sausages like with rubber bands Whoa. around them and like she would just be covered in hives if she just had had a bite of a banana it was just because she had her immune system was so overstimulated that just she was just being triggered like and her body couldn't handle it so like you know adaptogenic my- adaptogenic mushrooms kind of act like a thermostat in the body yeah. so if it's too high it's going to bring it down and if it's low it's going to bring it up versus stimulants like I don't, echinacea elderberry can be mm-hmm. a stimulant and yeah. it, like uh, so those I don't give to her because her immune system just runs that way I remember us talking about that actually yeah 
Yeah. So that's kind of, um, you know, in terms of like monitoring her, we did go through a process of like, what are excitotoxins and like, you know, even like citric acid and pectin and like, you know, there was another clean out of the house of like trying to calm her immune system because I was just wanting to make sure that she wasn't having like a flare up or just trying to support her in the best way. And there were some other, you know, immune system things that were happening that I ended up, um, <laughs> have you ever heard of the German dust? Dust no. test? No. I can't I don't I was working with somebody who was able to order this test that's done in Germany and you go through and you vacuum your house once and then you empty it with a new vacuum cleaner and then you empty out the dust into a bag and then you wait a week and let all the dust settle again and then you vacuum again and then you send in both samples and then they're able to tell you like whatever contaminants you have in your house, including like if it's on like the shingles or in no the, in the way. soil in, um, and you, and they're not like somebody who's like trying to sell you something yeah. afterwards. And because you know, the saying you can't heal in the place that you got sick. So there was, you know, I was trying to make sure that our home was a really safe place for her and we got the results back and I'm like, they were like almost perfect. There was one Whoa. thing that was like in like you may consider, but this is not what made her sick. And it was on something on the shingles or Whoa. something like that. But otherwise, it was sort of like your house is perfection in terms of like toxicity. And I was like, that's awesome. I was so yeah. excited. Did you like specifically like you went and vacuumed like the rug, the couch, the shingles, the bed? I didn't vacuum the shingles. Okay. So it's sort of like, you know, it if knows. you're in the house, like and if if there's stuff in the shingles or the soil, a lot of times in California, when when um, homes were built, they would treat it with a, speci a specific kind of chemical because of bugs or whatever. And then it kind of seeps up, you know, into the home. Oh so gosh. if you're living in the home, there's things that even if they're on the roof or Outside. even you know, in the chimney or anything, but if it's going to affect you, it's going to end up in the dust somewhere in the house. So yeah, we were vacuuming, I vacuumed couches and, you know, all everything that I could touch, I was Get, was getting vacuumed and That's so wild but at I this need that point test. Uh -huh, yeah. yes i need that test at this point yeah it was like no mold no like but they it was a it was a very lengthy uh test of what they looked for but at this point i've kind of like yeah it is what it is i mean i feel like we've uh, i know that our bodies are resilient and they're intelligent and i am not going to i'm like i cannot carry this burden anymore i'm like don't want to micromanage literally everything. And I was talking with my, um, I call her a therapist. She's like my story work coach and we can go into that. But yeah, she, I, I was explaining to her how maybe this is like eight months into the journey that there were some tangible things that I had done or had been pointed out to me that had shifted in me. And I was like, well, like, you know, we went out to a restaurant and I let my daughter order fries and they were probably cooked in canola oil, but it was like, okay. Like, yeah. it, I think there's like the fear of it all that can like do something to you that's yeah. worse than, you know, the toxin itself. And, um, and she was like, you know, I was giving her some examples. Like somebody had pointed out to me, oh, you're not bringing your water bottle everywhere. And it wasn't because I didn't bring my water bottle with me because I felt like, I'm so thirsty all the time. It was like, I don't trust anybody else's water. Like I have yeah. to have my own filtered, structured water and I must have it, you know, don't come near me with your tap water. And um, I got some headphones. This is this is going to shock the community. They are... Um, Bluetooth headphones. Kim Kardashian. Oh my god! Noise canceling Bluetooth headphones. This was back in like January. I forgot. She like has that headphone collab situation. But do you know the people who knew me best, which part of that was the most surprising to them? Not that it was Bluetooth, but... <laughs> nor that it was Kim Kardashian because I had talked about skims before and caused like an uproar on the internet because I wore had some skims. Oh my gosh. Um, it was that noise canceling. And I think when... Is there a whole thing with noise canceling I don't know about? Not from a toxin perspective, okay. but be from a... Or maybe there is, I don't know. From a hypervigilant state. Like, I, like the fact that I'm not like this right now to have one ear exposed is like is progress for me that I can like Whoa. have my ears because I have to be on guard Whoa. of hearing somebody come up behind me or hear somebody need me. 
the fact that I can wear like noise canceling headphones is a huge difference that would not have happened like a year and a half ago. Okay, so let's talk about that then. <laughs> well, and so when I was telling her some of these things, she was like, um, I had said, you know, I just, you know, have lived my life in a way that, you know, I just don't, I don't want anybody to be harmed, even just a little bit. Like it just kind of came off so casual and she was just so good about, she's just repeating things back to you. And she's just like, okay, hold on. Like, can you, can you, did you hear that? Like, you don't want anybody else to be harmed. She's like, you've got all these stories. And at this point we've been talking for like eight months and she's like, this girl at four years old that went through this, this girl at 12 year old who went through this, this girl at 16 and 17 and 20 that went through all these things. She's like, in all that time, what was being formed is like, I don't want anybody else to be harmed. Even, you know, in this capacity, even down to food, right? Yeah. And she's like, all of that has formed from, and I'm like, gosh, I never had connected those of like my advocacy and my platform and like the clean ingredients and like is all formed from, I don't want this to happen to anybody else. Yeah. And there was so much, the number of times that I've been called brave or courageous, it's been for other people because it wasn't easy for me to speak for myself. Yeah. I was good. I learned how to say no and go like, oh, that doesn't feel good. I don't like that. But to advocate for people to be proactive, like was more for others and not for me. It was like, oh, I don't, I went through this. I don't want you to go through this. Yeah. So, so what did you go through? One of the main ingredients in our product line, saffron, has been proven over and over again in clinical double-blind placebo trials to be an effective form of treatment for depression, anxiety, and ADHD. Saffron has been used by many cultures for thousands of years for these purposes, and now the research is here to finally back it up, proving that plant medicines and ancient healing practices can actually be an effective alternative to pharmaceuticals. From caffeine-free latte powders to saffron baths and capsules, there's something for any modern woman looking for ancient healing. Again, that's code the fullest podcast at checkout for 15% off. I hope you enjoy your new daily saffron ritual. So first of all, like I um I started what's called story work. And the idea about story work is that, you know, we all have stories. And we all have stories that have weaved us into who we are. And some of them haven't been tended to. There's a quote, and I can't remember who said it, that trauma isn't what necessarily happens to us. It's what we hold in our body in the absence of an empathetic witness. And so it's like, you wow. and I could go through the same event here in this room together. And what happens after is like one of the most important things. If you go home to this, you know, loving, nurturing environment that's able to acknowledge what happened and validate your experience and give you the care that you need. And then I go home to an environment that it's like not talked about or it is yeah. shamed or it is guilted, that that's where the, the trauma, yeah. yeah, where it gets formed is like you were unable to um, know what happened really, especially when at, at a younger age, maybe you weren't given the language for that. And so the idea of story work is that you go and revisit and you can actually, you tell, retell the story to a witness and somebody who is able to receive it in a regulated fashion. They have what's called like the window of tolerance because you don't want to go into like this hyper like panic state because healing doesn't happen over here yeah. and you don't want to suppress it where you're just kind of like, I don't want to cry through this. I don't, you know, I don't want to feel because healing doesn't happen there. So it's like this, this happy medium um, that the healing is going to happen and you're able to not only be acknowledged, but help name what what happened. And you can, you know, reprogram and reconnect some of the neurons in your brain that were previously disconnected over those events or the aftermath. Um, and uh, for me, going back and like naming 
the things that had died and like properly grieving the loss of those things, whether they were like it was an actual death or just the death of something yeah. that wasn't able to be processed at that time. Um, and one of my earliest, my earliest memory is a story of medical abuse and neglect. And funny enough, I was told, this was like one of my first stories to come up with a story of harm and one of blessing. And the medical abuse one happened to be my story of blessing because it came on, the, the blessing came on the heels of what had happened. And now I can look back on it and be like, that was kind of like my warped sense of what a blessing was. Yeah. Um, but it is not lost on me that that's my first memory is in a medical setting that, of course, I am here I am on the front lines of like medical advocacy and um, freedom for autonomy. And um, like I wouldn't even give birth without a doula because I'm like, I, ha I have to have an advocate with me because I don't know what I don't know. Yeah. And I've already been in so many situations in a medical setting that I was not heard or helped. And um, so that was like a necessity for me. Um, but then, but you know, what was the medical uh, setting? I'll just say that, I mean, I was four and it did, it affected me. I can't tell all of it, but it just affected me in my ability to give blood. Like I was not able to give blood for, I still can't. I, st I have not attempted to do it in the way where they, they draw it from your arm. I would always have to get it from the hand. And every time, you know, and at the time I was getting blood work done every th three months. And yeah. so I had to have this conversation a lot. And half the time the nurses were like, I'm really gentle. You have really good veins. I'm like, I know you just have to understand. I do this all the time. You have to do it from the hand. So it was, it was part of my, my like regular life that this story affected my body and my like, just, I had to tell the story so many times, but it was just sort of just like repeated. Okay. I need to do this. I need to lay down. Don't, you know, talk to me about something else. I'm just going to look away. I have, you know, it was just the process. Um, but then, so we did, we did work through that story, but my story, my story of harm was actually when I was, um, 16 and, you know, I think I had labeled it, I think I called it losing my virginity. And when I told the story and I, you know, cause sometimes you, you have things that like plague you, like, why does the story plague me? And I had to, it's one thing to remember the story and it's one thing to write it. It's a whole nother beast to like read it in front of somebody. Oh my gosh. And I'm recounting what happened and having this witness look at me and tell me like, like that was not like losing your virginity. Like, you understand that that was rape. And I'm like, no, no. Because, you know, when you, here I am 16 years old, hardly any sex education. And our, my idea of rape, along with a lot of other women, looked totally different. It wasn't from somebody that you knew. It didn't happen, like, in a familiar place. It, um, you know, in my case, it was somebody who had, um, I had, was asking me for a ride home and took, con like, commandeered my car and drove me somewhere. And it was somebody that was, f you know, fairly popular, that was charming, that was um, somebody that I thought, you know, was safe. And, now I know looking back, like he knew exactly what he was doing, exactly where to go in in a place where I was unable to be heard or helped. So when they ask for consent, when they look you in the eye and say, this is what you want, right? What am I going to do? What is anybody going to do? Like, what, what if I say no? Like, you're, you're scared for your life. Like, I... I could just be rolled out of this car and nobody would ever find me like the place where we were at. And I learned that day that I could cry without tears. 
and scream with no voice. And, but they talk about, you know, what, what happens to you, but it was the after. It was the getting home. It was the rush to get rid of evidence, to clean myself, to hurry and make sure that nobody found out what I had done because this was my fault. Oh my God. And it wasn't, it didn't happen to me. I did this. And um, so there was this, you know, lack of nurture and care that I even didn't give myself because there was such a lack of an awareness about what, what had happened. Yeah. And so I, we actually had to go through that story two different times, um, months apart, because one was about like, I was, I was so hurt from the aftermath more than anything. So we worked through that first. And then I went back and like actually like went through the event itself. And that's when she was like, are you ready to name this yet? Because I was, I kept calling it like, okay, well, it was just my first sexual experience. Like I wasn't even able to like name it. And then I was able to name it and say, no, that was rape. And then she asked me to go write a letter to my 16-year-old self, <laughs> which, you know, I've heard like, you know, you talk to your inner child and I'm like, yeah, Ugh. yeah. And I think being a mom like made it so much easier because I imagined that happening to my daughter. Oh my god, Exact I situation and going, oh no, yes, this, yes, this was rape. And this is exactly what I would offer her. So I was able to then, you know, transition that and offer that to myself. And it was so healing for me to um, to speak to myself that way. And yeah, nurture yourself, like what you didn't get. From, I mean, yeah. you didn't share that with your family at all. Mm -mm. Like, do you have siblings or mm -hmm. and you just didn't tell them anything? I mean, I think some people had found out that stuff had happened, yeah. but it wasn't it wasn't the story. Nobody knew what had really yeah. happened. My gosh. Yeah. And do you think that that also comes from coming from a family that doesn't want to name things? Or like, why do you think that you didn't want to? Or <laughs> like, it could be society too. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, there... I don't I, I don't know how to like properly categorize where it all came from because it was like kind of the culture and generational like yeah of course stuff came from your home and what was acceptable or not acceptable what you talked about what you didn't talk about um what your body looked like you know, like there was so much for a woman in a religious upbringing about what mm. you did or didn't do with your body and you cause men to do this and um and not even really understanding and knowing like you know sexuality and desires that come from within because we were taught they came from outside yeah. in the, in the bad place and so there was a lot of guilt and shame and Around, around all that that I've had for decades about, you know, my body and sexuality and that is woven in my entire being that, you know, that's kind of next, the whole spiritual journey yeah. and kind of religious stuff that I've kind of like segmented off because I've been working through some of uh, some other trauma like that was one incident that happened to me that was in a car that was my own car and there was another incident that happened where I was taken in another car years later and oh my god I do have moments like I blacked out I can't remember but when I did get to a place where I um was able to like try and leave the car. Like I almost couldn't get out of the car because my shoe got stuck when I was trying to get out and I hadn't really even connected. But I, what I had normalized was that I can't relax in cars. Like as a passenger, I could not, I could never be, go on a 10 hour road trip. I could not sleep or relax. I would just be like really tense and I had to take my shoes off. Um, oh and gosh. there was one, time recently, maybe like two years ago, year and a half ago or so, we were out in the backyard and we were like 
doing something with the garden and it was summer so it was hot but there was a lot of prickly stuff so i had i don't know why i put on my hunter boots without socks but i was doing and then i had to go move my car and i mentally like as i'm walking towards my car I have to like psych myself up. I'm like, I don't want to take my shoes off. Like these boots, yeah. you know, rubber boots that are up here. And I'm like, I'm just backing out the car from the garage. To, I'm, I'm backing it out 10 feet. I get in the car and I go into a full blown panic attack because my shoes are on and I go to take them off and I'm sweating because it's outside and it's hot. And I'm just like tr- trying to pull them off and it's hitting the steering wheel. And I couldn't get, I had to like flail myself out of the car to get oh my, my shoes off just to back the car out even with you driving even with me driving because yeah. they were they were so big and clunky yeah. like and it wasn't about like somebody's going to take me it was like if there's an emergency i can't get out yeah that's like, how it processed. this is this is how like it manifests itself oh in some capacity is that like like at that point were you acknowledging that that's where it came from? No, I had not connected it. Really? No, because I hadn't started any of this stuff yet. Like, but I, but I knew that I had a problem with it. So like, hence me psyching myself up to go back out my car. Oh my gosh. So since I've, yeah, I, I notice now, like if I'm pastor in a car, I'm like, I can like, like lean back and close my eyes. And I'm like, I did it on the way here. Like I was just, you know, had my noise canceling headphones in, <laughs> oh listening to my music. And the, and like the driver was like attempting to talk to me at some point, And I was just in my own zone. I'm like, this is not what I was Ever used to experienced do. before. Mm-hmm. No, of being able to just, you know, relax because I mean, being think- in a hypervigilant state it's hard to do that. And think about how that passes on to your daughter now. Yeah. How beautiful that is to be able to process and, but also before, like I know a lot of us moms and, and we talked about this, like a lot of this healing it's again, it's so interesting. Cause you said, it's not for me. It's for other people. Mm-hmm. Like we were kind of talking about, and you know, it started as it's not for me. It's for my daughter. Yeah. And how, yes. you know, it's... And that's originally why I started the, yeah. the story work in general, because, I, you know, I don't know who sent this to me. And, and if they are listening to this, tell me, like send me a DM and tell me that this was you. But somebody sent me the podcast from Adam Young called The Place We Find Ourselves. And I, I don't know if I was sharing something about like, because I had not started the therapy yet. Um, and he was kind of my introductory into what story work is and he does the whole explanation in the beginning about you know what it is and what kind what's your attachment and here I was thinking I have a secure attachment and then going oh maybe it's ambivalent oh no I'm avoidant attached like I had to go through like my own little steps of like denial to be like oh yeah that's what happened and um and I think what so I was able to like kind of like process through like some of the podcast because at that point you can kind of scroll through and be like, what topics do I want to listen to or whatever? And he did this post um, two part series about sexuality and like talking to your kids. And we had been very open with our daughter, like bodies. And, Cause of course, like I went from one side to the other and I yeah. wanted her to, you know, Name. not, not have any shame. And so at least I knew that. And I, you know, so she's very comfortable in her body. And I um, was listening to them explain that when you're talking to your kids about sex and sexuality and like, you know, even if you're using all the right words, even if you're, you know, saying it the right way and get having these open conversations and the dialogue, if you have unhealed sexual trauma or shame or guilt, like they're going to pick up on that still. You can still pass it on to them because, you know, their left brain and the, is is communicating and they can read it on you and kids are intuitive. So it was at that point that I'm like, oh, I guess I got to do this because <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I thought that just me changing some behaviors and changing the way that I did things that were different than the way they were done for me would be enough. And so I was sort of like, oh, okay, I got to go dive into this. Which, you know, I, sometimes I walked into story work with like absolute dread and trepidation. Like, I'm like, I don't, I don't yeah. want to talk about this. I don't want to relive that. Sometimes when I'm 
remembering my story, I go back and I'm like, okay, what was happening back then? Like, I want to look at a map. Where was I? Yeah. And I want to look at that person that I associate with this. And, um, and like, I would look at a map and like try and figure out where we went and I'd be shaking. Like, and I'm like, this clearly lives in our body. And, you know, Bessel, is it his name? Bessel van der Kolk, he wrote The Body Keeps the Score and his whole, I, oh, you wow. know, he says that, um, that we, you know, we remember for a reason and I, I'm not going to do the quote any justice, but he says something to the effect of, you know, our bodies, whether we're like subconsciously or consciously remembering, like there's a whole reason for it. And if we haven't processed it, like it's, it's living in our body somewhere. And so when I have a physical reaction like that, like I know that this is a story I need to tell. This is a story that needs to be named, that needs to be grieved, that needs to, you know, be processed and cat properly categorized and so that then I can move move on with my life because the thing with like trauma and trauma like it can be such a triggering word especially on the internet these days that people use it as an excuse well that's just a trauma response but it's like we we have a responsibility to address that in ourselves and then we move through it so I don't look at my stories and be like, I'm destined to like stay in this like victimized state or stay in this like sad, like I will drive with my hunters on. Now I will eventually get blood work done from my arm. Yeah, yeah. I will, I'm <laughs> going to heal this stuff. I'm yeah. not going to live in that, in those spaces of like hypervigilance and like, just like constant, like what what's, what's out to get me. Cause that's what I People are here to harm me. They're here to find me and hurt everything that I love. And so even like joy um, is, it was such a hard thing to express. So when I would be happy or have some sort of fulfillment, like I would be like stoic because if somebody sees that I'm happy, they'll know what to take away from me. Whoa. So to like live in that place is really, it's sad. And I don't, I didn't want to be there anymore. So, um, you know, I started working through the, you know, the sexual stuff. Um, the, there unfortunately numerous stories of harm that I had there. And interestingly enough, um, I started to like describe kind of what I was feeling to my story work. I call her story worker. She's, that's not what <laughs> they're like called. It. She, I told her that one time she was like, Ooh, I feel like, Ooh, I'm a yeah. story worker. Um, she is incredible, but, um, she was like, what you're describing is like when, when you are going through girl to womanhood, you're going through these changes. When that happens in a place of safety and um, education and your curiosity is encouraged, like there's something that happens in your body that you're like, this is, this is, this is my body. Like this is beautiful. This is wonderful. And I didn't experience that. And she's like, this is what you're experiencing that now. Like you're going like, I, it was like for the first time to be like, this is mine this is my home and it's it's not something that i need to guard as a target or use as a shield like this is a beautiful wonderful thing and i was like kind of coming into my womanhood mm -hmm. around the same time that my daughter's body started to shift and Whoa. change so we kind of were experiencing it at the same time That's and so here she was like she would be I don't want to give too much away because I mean, these are all her own personal stories, but it was so beautiful for me to like watch her be exuberant about the things that were changing. Cause I'm like, yes, like this yeah. is exciting. This is not something to be afraid of or shamed of. Like these are our beautiful bodies that are, you know, are ours. And um, so that was kind of a, you know, a wonderful thing and interesting timing with with just like her at the same time as yeah. me and um so that was kind of special and then how did that lead into surgery oh yes the <laughs> the number one question yes. that i've been getting like what surgery did you have because it was like um an 11 hour surgery um yeah so as i was you know 
come, oh, well, first of all, I think what is, I cannot forget to mention is that, you know, my whole journey over the past nine years had been like always with the idea of this hormones in mind. And I had talked to so many different doctors, hormone specialists and functional medicine doctors, conventional doctors, naturopathic doctors. And they were like, you're going to be reliant on bioidentical hormones your whole life. Like you're just, you're just going to have to accept it. Like all of them. And I was talking to... Um, did you ever take any? Just really quick. Oh, yes. You did? Yes. Oh, wow. I was on... Um, I think we tried like all the natural ways. To do what though? To balance my hormones. Like I felt... I remember saying at one point, I'm like, I realized why people were committed back in the day, like before they understood, like their hormones were crazy. Like yeah. I felt crazy. And then, you know, I was was on bioidenticals for a while and um, then I would try and wean off. Like I would take like like uh, uh, 75% and it would throw everything off. Like I, and then it would take me like a month of get, being back on that regimen to like get back to normal. And so I was a little like I, I every time I would try it would it would fail in a way that impacted everybody around yeah. me. <laughs> so it wasn't until um, so I was worked with this guy Josh from Real Food Gangsters. Do you follow him? No. Um, and he was the first one that was kind of helping me understand. Like, okay, so let's let's rebalance these meals here and bioidenticals. We can totally get off of those. Like, I think I think um, we wow. can we can help you support what you're doing with therapy and food. And I didn't realize like how important that therapy was. And when you talk about things living in your body, when I worked through those stories, I was able to stop the bioidenticals like that. Like I didn't go like gradually wean. I had, and this is not like medical advice for everyone. Don't stop taking your bioidenticals. Yeah. Work with a trusted specialist and therapist. Okay. Um, I, like, no kidding. It makes so much sense that that was like living in my sex organs and I was able to like release that. And they were able to go back to doing what they were originally designed to do, which was produce what I had been supplementing. And That's it didn't insane. take forever. It didn't, t it was like, ah, oh, you're free. Yeah. And that was like one of like the biggest, I think, tangible effects for me was like, Oh, I finally balanced my hormones. I needed story work. <laughs> it makes so much sense. I had that same experience with uh, just like working with a therapist and my thyroid. Like that's another reason why I was able to heal naturally from Hashimoto's because I simultaneously my doctor did a one year program with me where I would check in with him multiple times a month and we would just, it was therapy. And it, I was able to speak my truth and, mm -hmm. and go through, you know, all of the pain and it's, yeah, yeah I, I, I'm a huge believer in emotional work, yeah. really helping heal the body. So I'm just so well, excited. And I know, you know, Zach yeah. Bush and, oh, you yeah. know, this guy who has like three medical degrees talking about emotions. And I was talking to him and he said to me at this point, and I'm pretty sure he'd say the same thing. He said that his current world worldview was that most chronic conditions on the physical state start with an emotional injury because it gives that something to hold on to. And I've just found that, oh, I think this, he said this to me back in like 2017, like I found that to be like continually true with not only myself, but other people that I come in contact with, yeah. that there's, there's a root there that, um, is, isn't just, isn't physical. But it's also a matter of, like you said, just it's uncomfortable and going there and examining it and naming it and challenging, you know, what others are trying to say um, beforehand, like it's not able to be healed, like all yeah. of these things. I think you just have to be persevere through it and really be an advocate for yourself and right. and somehow really like be commit. It's really about commitment to getting to the root and yeah. obviously you found it, but I know part of your story too is, you know, a medical like mishap. Yeah. Right. And I'm sure this story work took you there. Is that right? Y yes. I mean, it wasn't like a full blown story that I wrote and read. It was something that I acknowledged that happened to me when I was, um, 
I think I was like 23 or 24. And I was taking ortho tricycline, it's birth control. And it just wasn't like affecting my, I was like breaking out all the time and I was getting all puffy and like gaining weight. And so I went to my OBGYN who was an old man. And that's that's its own issue. Like I would <laughs> refuse to see a woman gynecologist. Like I needed a man. And I, um, you know, I'm like, I don't like ortho tricycline. And he was like, well, let me tell you about this new thing we got called the Nuva Ring. And if you're not familiar with the Nuva Ring, it's kind of like the size of a rubber band. And it's like a thick, like a hair band. And you insert it into your vaginal canal and he's like it slowly releases hormones as the birth control method and um then you take it out and you have your period period and um and then you put it back in five days later he's like but if you don't want to have a period just leave it in there the whole time and i was like awesome and so i <sighs> took the nuvering and it was in for a few days and i started to notice uh, my boobs were growing and I was like, well, this is cool. And th th they didn't stop growing. They just oh kept getting, and I had like, you know, I, I feel like my body is particularly sensitive. And if I can look, I can look back on my, on my stories and see like how sensitive I was. And it's not lost on me that, that I was more susceptible probably because of emotional yeah. stuff I was carrying. But you know, when I, I was also a competitive gymnast and I stopped when I was 12 and it was like in those following months, it was like right before I skipped eighth grade and started high school, like a 12 year old, I like started my period, my boobs came in. It was all just sort of like, wham, like it just, that's just everything happened and changed really quickly. And so I start to notice like my boobs like growing and growing and growing and I was like, this is fantastic. They're like, they're getting all nice and big. And it's been like a week at this point. And my friends were like, you look like you had implants because That's the skin so was insane. so stretched and shiny that they looked like I had implants. And uh, this whole fun thing ha was like lasted for like a, like not that long before I realized that there was a major problem because whatever was happening with my body, it, they they would not stop growing to the point where like they like the skin like split open oh in areas and I'm like oh my god like this is a problem and so I ended up taking out the Nuva ring and then within like I don't know three to five days they just <laughs> deflated so what I was left with was like just excess skin and again having this like body like the boobs were so sexualized that this was like. I can't tell anybody about this. Like I, I, I but I sat there and like I broke myself. I, I broke oh my, my body, gosh. and I never went back to the OBGYN. I never told him what happened. How I old were you? Twenty three. I was like twenty three. Yeah. Oh but I owned it. I was like, this was a consequence of a bad decision. Like this was, I can't believe I did that. Well, I'm just wrecked for life. And and you blamed was, yourself, of course. Yeah, because I was like, I was on birth control and having sex, and like that was bad. Oh my gosh. So of course me being on birth control was like the bad choice I made. And um, so it was like, okay, well, I guess I have to live with this forever. And it was, and it wasn't even a story that I brought up. It was just me going through that process of coming into my own body that I was like, hey, I can fix this. Like, and it's okay to want to fix it. And that had this, had I had a medical mishap that like screwed up my finger, I wouldn't have sec like thought twice about it. Like, yeah. of course, I'm going to go fix it. But this was so different, and this was so personal, and this was so shameful. And um, like, you felt ashamed for wanting to fix it, or you didn't even want to fix it. No, I wanted to, oh but gosh. it was never even a. Th you can't even get that thought in your head without going. Not an option. Like, no, it's not acceptable. You have to live with this. Like, you did this, and. Um, so yeah, it was like, I, um, it was like in an instant, I was like, I can fix this. I'm like researching, like, who am I going to go to? Like, it wasn't even like, I need to think about this. It was like, no, I'm doing this. Like, oh my gosh. I can't believe I've, um, it's been almost 20 years that I haven't like actually been okay and given myself permission to want to get back what was taken from me. And, um, 
it wasn't too long into the um, <laughs> process of researching that I'm like, who would know what to do? And I called Jenna. I love it. And she, I'm on the phone with her and I hear her. Hold on. I'm texting. All right. I have a name for you. And I like, so of Jenna. course, she had a name from a referral. And I, you know, call the office and they're like 14 month wait list for a consult. And I'm like, I was referred by, so I totally had to name drop. And they're like, oh, we'll put you on the wait list. And so like I had a consult the next week and this was probably like December-ish. And then I had the surgery in May. So um, so they just went in and like took out all the excess skin that was created during the, ex- it's sort of like, you know, if someone gains a lot of weight and has yeah. like the excess skin, so they go in and like clean it all up. But I wanted some, you know, you want it to look good. So That's the point. <laughs> I had a perfect perfectionist of a surgeon who, you know, put them back to their original design. And um, are you so happy? Like, does it feel nice? I mean, I know you're still kind of in post-op stage. Yes. Yeah, so it's been like three months, I think, exactly. And I was just in his office yesterday doing a follow-up appointment and checking out like if there's, you know, um, because... What would have been easier was to do implants, be, just fill up the excess skin, right? Yeah. I would have had to go somewhere between like double Ds, like uh, a little bit bigger than double Ds to fill up the extra skin. And I'm like, that just, it's so unnatural. And, you know, he, even though he's a plastic surgeon, he's like, he does things very cautiously. He's like, so I, with all of my patients, I tell them if you're going to get implants, we, I, I need to replace them in 10 years. And so I'm like, well, no. what am I going to do? Do you, like I'm gonna do this again when I'm 50, and then when I'm 60, and then like no, I just want to, I just want back what I had like yeah. before the Nuva ring, and but that meant that it needed to be more of an invasive surgery because implants you just oh. you wouldn't even be able to tell that there was an incision, and so with with what I had done, there was a lot more incision work. You had to involve the nipple. You had to go like so. It went, Ugh, if there's so any, painful. it wasn't, it wasn't vanity in terms yeah. of like, cause there's scarring, but it's like they're reattached to where they need to be. And, um, so yeah, like I, he was showing me videos yesterday and I was like, I don't even recognize those. That's crazy. Like it's and it's only been three months, but like, yeah, like these are, these are mine and I'm so happy. I'm and so what happy about your them. daughter? Like, how are you, how do you explain She was it? sort of like, you know, she was understanding what was yeah. happening. And the only part she got sad about was that, uh, that, um, I could not pick her up for a while oh. and she, and she's 10 and she's at so- the time. Yeah. She was nine yeah. when we were having the conversation and she was, she was like crying. Like, she's like, I, that I wouldn't be able to pick her up and hold her. And like, if she couldn't fall asleep or sometimes for the longest time, she'd crawl on top of me and my boobs were her pillow. Oh. Like, so she would lay on top of me and she knew she couldn't do that for a while either. Um, but it was like a couple of weeks ago, she was just like, are you happy with your boobs now? And I like <laughs> instinctively, I just laughed. And, but like, these are, these are questions that I'm like, I love that she asks those questions. Not only that she asks them, but she feels safe and comfortable and it, you know, entitled to ask those questions and it's okay. And that's just, I feel like I'm so happy that you feel that and it's okay to ask me those questions. I know so many people also were asking you about the surgery. So yeah, yeah. A lot of people wanted to know and, um, like, why did you keep it private for a while? I'm definitely somebody who will take on stress from other people. So if I took, If I told people, hey, I'm going to go have, you know, reconstructive surgery, I'd be getting like, be be careful of da 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 Be careful of this and don't do this because your nerves and don't do this with medication. And and it it would be so much information that I wanted to keep the circle small of people that I knew and that I trusted. And I didn't need to invite all of the fear in, in that at all. And I wanted to do it. I wanted to recover without anybody else's freaking opinions and and I can sit here and go look I survived I had anesthesia I was under for 11 hours I detox properly I'm like properly healing my body and I feel wonderful and I feel great and I didn't need anybody else to come in and tell me that what I was doing was dangerous or you know god forbid sinful yeah 
Well, your story is just so important. And I'm just so grateful that you were open to sharing it with us because I, I really believe in this work. And obviously you got to where you are in just making that decision. Like we just talked about because of the work on the emotional side, the therapy. And I think that's missing in our conversation when we talk about all things wellness. And Mm -hmm. obviously people are, you know, we, we talk about therapy a lot, but I don't know if people are willing to get really deep into how their emotional body is affecting everything else in their life, their relationships, their relationship with themselves, the way that their hormones are working. Like it's so deep. And just to sit here and hear from you, Mm -hmm. like where you're at now versus where you were. Like I had no idea about noise canceling. I had no idea, idea about like, you know, that feeling of getting in a car, being a passenger, needing to figure out how to get out, like all of those things. I mean, to even be able to talk about it the way you did. Yeah. It's so beautiful and so important. I mean, like, because I know I've gone through those stories like that too. And birth trauma, like I couldn't even speak about the fact that, I mean, I did have a doula and I still was given something called Cytotec, which is an abortion pill when they induced me for my son. And I couldn't even talk about it afterwards. Mm -hmm. And like, it was so important for me to process Mm -hmm. that story and name it and, and now be able to be on the side of like sharing about it and speak about it. Because the more people do that, the more inspiring it is for others to challenge their stories to examine what's going on and to stop like in a way like you said you started it with I don't want this to happen to anyone else well it's like to stop it so that we can look at it within ourselves so we don't pass it down yeah to others yeah and to empower others like that's a whole nother thing like empower others to do what they want to do with their body Mm -hmm. when they feel, you know, I mean, that's a whole nother thing. Like, what do you have to say about that? Someone who's like feeling shame around wanting to do something. Yeah. I think, um, and I know that this exists because I have talked on my stories about like sex and sexuality, like before I even started story work before, because there were just, I think we were talking about somebody's like viral stories that were talking about belly button sex. Did uh, you hear about this? No. Where there were a lot of like um, religious oh my gosh. people that were not given the education about what sex was and they thought that you involved the belly button. And so this was like a whole thing. And I had actual messages from people that said, that's what I thought too. Like we like you tried to get pregnant through the belly button. Like that's what, so there was like just, first of all, a whole miseducation of like women my age who had never had an orgasm that didn't even know what sex was that. So I know that there is, there is, there are a lot of people out there who have been given, handed down shame, not okay to ask questions about it not okay to want things either. And that was, I think, if I can give any message to anyone, that has been, I think, particularly helpful for me to look back. Because I've had people in in my life that have been, you know, in my past before that have helped me remember yeah. things. And one of them was that I want things. Like, it's not enough to just say, no, I don't like that. What is your yes? Like what what is moving you forward? What do you want? Yeah. And like having people help me remember that like I can see that you want things. And like what are they? How can I help you get that? And so even that is like still an uncomfortable question to me. Like what do I want? It feels foreign. To be like, what do I want? I know what I don't want, but what do I want? And so I think if people can like, like tune into like what, yes, we are created and designed and like we have desires. What are they? They're not, I think they've been demonized in a lot of different societal norms to want things and to identify that 
And so even if I didn't have a story of, of the medical manipulation to my body, even if this was post motherhood, like it's okay to want it to look different. It's okay. And that's, it is normal to want to be, to feel good in your own skin. And, um, so you're not going to catch me like shaming anybody for like going, Oh, I don't have a story of that. It's my story. Isn't dramatic enough. My story isn't traumatic yeah. enough. My story isn't blah, blah, blah. I just, I'm unhappy with this. Okay. Like why? But why though? I think I would ask the why first. Like, why are you unhappy with it? Is it because somebody else told you or is it because like you want it? Yeah. I love that because I definitely want to end there because so many people today, I think, fall into things because they don't ask themselves, what do I want? And they don't yeah. allow it. Yeah. Just like you're saying. And so then we, a lot of people just end up numbing mm -hmm. themselves to not even want like what you were saying. You were like, this keeps plaguing me. Like yeah. there's something there. Yeah. And so much of society is really about just that, like just numbing yourself so you don't really listen to your intuition. To, but if you just started with why do I want this and what do I want? Mm -hmm. And we were empowered to ask ourselves that question, our life would be yeah. so different. Give yourself permission to feel that and have that permission, I think is is part of it. And you can give yourself the permission. You don't need anybody yeah. else's. So beautiful. Thanks, Jenny. I love mm -hmm. you so much. I'm just so grateful for your friendship and and for you coming here and sharing your well, story. Well, thank you with for us. giving me the opportunity to explain it because I know people wanted to know and it's a bigger story than, you know, just going on Instagram and putting on a few slides, you yeah. know.